Well, you're welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. John Duggan with you through to five o'clock. Now, 30 years ago, Pat McDonough, Terry McHugh, Jerry Mackin, and Marky Sheridan became Ireland's first representatives at a Winter Olympics at Albertville in France. Next month, between February the 4th and 20th, the 2022 Winter Olympics will take place in Beijing. Team Ireland will have at least six athletes qualified. You may remember Baron Clifton Rottesley, who was fourth in the skeleton back in 2002 at Salt Lake City, the closest Ireland had been to a medal at a Winter Games. But the Olympics is more than silverware. It's the pride of making it. It is the friendships you foster. It is the spirit of the competition. Ireland does not have snow unless we have a beast in the east. So we're going to speak to, though, three Team Ireland athletes who have plenty of experience in these conditions. They've been at Olympic Games before, and they're going to be there again in China. We're delighted to be joined at the pre-games training camp by snowboarder Seamus O'Connor, representing Ireland at a third Winter Olympics, freestyle skier Bubba Newby, who made his Olympic debut in Korea four years ago, and alpine skier Tez Arbe, who's also marking her second appearance at a Winter Olympics. Seamus, Bubba and Tess, you're very welcome to Off the Ball Saturday. Thanks very much for having us. We're, we're excited to be here. And I was on YouTube last night, folks, watching the 2018 Olympics snowboarding, half pipe and slope style and freestyle skiing and giant slalom. I'm thinking to myself, folks, this is really dangerous. This is so exciting. The adrenaline must be incredible when you're doing these events. Obviously, you're very skilled at it. Just for the broad audience we have, Seamus, just to start, perhaps you could explain snowboarding and the half pipe. It reminded me of the skateboarders I used to see on TV in that kind of cylinder when they go from one end to the other and they go up in the air, but you're doing it on ice. Yeah. Um... Boiled down, snowboarding is um, going, you know, it's essentially just a, a piece of wood. And at the end of the day, it's frozen water. Um, that's very simplified. And the half pipe um, is about, uh, we want to say 11, 12 meters tall. Um, and um, we get five to six different tricks throughout the, the length of the half pipe, um, which varies from half pipe to half pipe. Um, and like you said, pretty similar to skateboarding. That's where snowboarding gained its inspiration from. Um, so if you've seen a skateboard ramp, um, you know, that the likes of Tony Hawk may have been in, it's uh, pretty similar to our sport. And Bubba, it's not too dissimilar to what Seamus does, but you're on skis when you do it. Yeah, it's the exact same venue, same half pipe. We just do it on skis instead of a snowboard. So how do you score it, Seamus and Bubba? How, like, how do they decide who's good? Who's the Sean White? Who's the uh, Red Gerard of these uh, pieces? Who's the David Wise, you know? Well, it's a judged event. And so there's some discretion there. It's up to the judges, but it's basically down to direction. You got to spin left and right amplitude how high you're going out of the pipe if you're going six meters out well, that's pretty high if you're going like 15 feet out of the half pipe um you get scored a lot better and then variety what different tricks uh, tricks you're doing the axes and uh execution and then the biggest thing is style if you can make it look good and smooth but make it look like you never left the ground then you get more points for that can you turn up with new tricks at this Olympic Games you wouldn't have had four years ago that the judges don't even know? We're seeing a lot of that in the snowboarding discipline. Um, there's been the emergence of triple corks now, which is um, three flips mixed in with at least three, if not four rotations. Um, and it's only been seen once in competition before the Olympics. And so that'll definitely be giving um, the judges, uh, you know, their, their, their money's worth to, to work on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's totally up to the rider. Whatever you do, um, freedom of expression through style or tricks is totally up to, to us, which kind of makes it unique. Um, so yeah, the judges will have their, their work cut out from, I'm sure. And for you, Tess, it's a bit like more what we normally see on the TV with skiing that's downhill and you've got the slalom element where you've got to go through the flags at a, at a, at a fast pace and uh, not make mistakes. How have you been able to get to the position now where you're going for your second Olympic Games? It's been a long road for you, has it? Yeah, so since the last time I was racing only in slalom and GS, so uh, the big thing was to qualify in speed two. It, um, you get speed uh, until like 100 kilometers. So uh, you have to be uh, better to race in speed. So that was the big, um, the big goal. And so I'm happy to, 
to race in speed now for the, the next Olympic Games. So what's the key thing for you in slalom? Is it to avoid making mistakes? Is it to keep uh, on the right side of the flags? Uh, yeah, in slalom, uh, the turns are really short, so a small mistake can put you out of the gate. So this is really difficult. So, but the key is to like always fight, even if you make mistakes, keep pushing because you don't know what's possible and everybody's making mistakes. So you need to, to keep pushing. So how are you representing Team Ireland, Tess? I believe you're from an Irish-French family. Yeah, so my mom is Irish and my dad is French. And you're training all the time on the Swiss border, is that right? Have you got the Alps near you? Yeah, uh, I train in Meribel in France. And I go to the university in Switzerland, so I'm both in France and Switzerland. So you're doing a bit of biomedicine, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So what's the day-to-day -day then for you, Tess? Uh, like how many hours a week are you spending on the slopes? Uh, it depends on the university, but most of the time it's uh, four hours per day, and then maybe four days uh, in a row, and then one day of break, and then go back to four days of training. Yeah, very intense. And has COVID made it more difficult? Uh, actually, it was easier for me with COVID because uh, all the university was uh, online. So I was really happy about the, the COVID situation. Uh, when are you graduating? Uh, next year. Oh, very good. Seamus, you're a dab hand at this now. This is your third Olympic Games. You're a veteran of Team Ireland. Uh, you were at this at a very young age, a snowboarding lark. Yeah, um, thinking back on it now, back to 2014, it, it, it feels almost a lifetime ago. Um, so now to be coming back for my third Olympics is pretty surreal, um, especially after last time, I wasn't exactly sure if I would continue with the sport. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's all been such an amazing journey and, and very thankful to be coming back for a third time around and um, you know, welcoming it with open arms. And your pater paternal grandparents are from Ireland? That's correct. From, from Dublin and Drada. So how did you get into snowboarding? Um, through my parents' work, actually. Uh, my parents run a brain injury rehabilitation facility um, in Southern California. And so they used to take their clients adaptive skiing. Um, so when I was 18 months old, um, I was already on snow. My dad put me on skis, you know, as part of these trips. And I was just kind of, uh, you know, on the sidelines as my parents worked. And then when I was about three and a half, I asked my dad if I could snowboard the following winter. Um, and then, you know, I turned four and here we are. Never looked back. And Bubba, you were born in Cork. Yep. My father was teaching there at the university when I was born. And do you guys get to know each other in the last few years, given, you know, are you both in Utah at the moment? Are you at that part of the U.S.? Yeah, we both live. I live about an hour away from him, but. We hang out all the time now since 2018, pretty much became best friends, I'd say. Do all sorts of activities together. Not, not snow ones, not necessarily snow ones. All of the above, really. Yeah, very good. And how did you get into the freestyle skiing, Bubba? Um, my dad taught me to ski when I was four years old. And then we'd go up every weekend. My whole family would go ski and then as my older brothers got into high school and stuff they started doing other sports but i just stuck to skiing i had such such a good time so much fun and so then i saw that there was actually a, like a competition aspect of it because i would just go ski for fun kind of weekend warrior style and then like it wasn't even until 2014 that my event was in the olympics so that wasn't really an option so it wasn't really the goal or anything. I was just skiing for fun. Then it got uh, an Olympic event. It became an Olympic event and kind of started going more competitive with it. And how did you end up getting a situation where you're a Team Ireland member and you're behind the Irish flag? Bubba? How did it all kind of work out? Oh, uh, well... I was just in normal competitions when I was younger. There wasn't. I was technically skiing just without, not really for a national team at all. And then I saw Seamus compete in 2014 in Sochi. And I was like, oh, okay, I can do this too. This might be possible. So I reached out to the Irish Snow Sports Federation and then was able to start competing for them. 
and your story in terms of how you hooked up with Team Ireland, Seamus? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of developed as a pipe dream. Um, when I was really young, the announcement that uh, the 2014 games would be in Sochi, and um, my mother is actually from Siberia. So my dad kind of threw out the sort of wild idea. He's like, hey, man, like, what if, you know, what if you were able to compete in Russia for Ireland? you know, be an American born athlete and just bring, bring all your, you know, the whole culmination of your life together in this one place. And, you know, I was pretty young and, um, you know, didn't really knew, you know, what, what all that would mean. Um, but then started working towards it. And as I got better in snowboarding, that became more of a realistic goal. Um, and then similar to Bubba, I, I reached out to the, the snow sports federation and, you know, sent them like a little sponsor me video, um, and they got back to me and I started doing, um, world cup competitions under the Irish flag and, you know, the rest is history. And Tess, how did you link up with the team Ireland? Oh, uh, it's hard to remember. It's been a, a while, but, uh, my brother was racing for Ireland too. So he was older than me. He was still, he was racing for Ireland. So I said, okay, I can maybe do the same. And I just joined him in the team. What kind of equipment do you need to be involved in skiing tests? Is it expensive, uh, you know, uh, like to deal with the cold? Obviously there's a the skis, but like, are there certain things that are absolutely necessary for you to have every day? Uh, so the skis are very expensive and we have uh, at least two pairs uh, per discipline. So it's made lots of pairs. And then uh, you can have different boots for the speed races or the technical races, uh, different helmets, different protection. So this is really, really expensive and you absolutely need them. And after uh, like everything, the suit and that's it, I think. Seamus, what equipment did you, do you need for what you do? Um, yeah, you know, quite, quite a rap sheet. Um, I usually travel with three to four snowboards to the various events that I go to one to two bindings, which mount our feet to the board. Um, and then the rest of it is honestly pretty stock standard, you know, um, some winter clothing, um, obviously a helmet is important and our goggles and, and whatever else, but aside from our hard goods, um, you know, it's, it's all pretty typical winter wear. You're in the same boat. Would you be using different skis now, Bubba, to what they'd be using, for example, what Tess uses? Yeah, so the skis we use are called twin tips. They are curved up at the tip and the tail, so you can go backwards. And uh, as opposed to race skis, they're just a tip in the front. And so I always travel with at least two pair, just because I tend to break everything. <laughs> You need, you need a PA, Bubba. You need someone to kind of, I don't know, look after your equipment. Yeah, I need a full tech team behind us. Just, I don't know, with a little welder, some screws, just keeping it together. But uh, I also like to travel with plenty of layers too, so I don't get cold. A lot of merino wool. <laughs> and uh, the mixture, it gets cold out here, man. In Utah, what's Weird- so would Salt Lake City have been a huge thing for Utah and the state and getting people involved in what you've been doing every day? I think Salt Lake City is one of the best places to become a winter sport athlete and literally any winter sport. Because we have the Olympics there, we've got everything from every type of ski event and then we like even to bobsled tracks. So if you want to become a winter Olympian, Salt Lake is kind of a great place to do it. So we're talking to, to Tess there and she said you might do four hours a day. How many hours a day? Because I think this is kind of your gig anyway, isn't it, uh, Bubba, that you, you do a bit of teaching and that kind of thing. So does it all just kind of blend in when you're training for the uh, freestyle skiing that you're going to be doing in Beijing? Yeah, I mean, if we're doing like a legit training session, I'll do two to four hours, depending on how short or long the chairlift is. If you got a short chairlift lap time, two hours, you can get a lot of runs in and you get pretty beat. But two to four, uh, that's typically what we do. And then if we're not skiing half pipe and it's a good snow day, like if it dumped a foot of pow overnight, we're going to go all day if it's good, just because that's the time to ski. It's so much fun. And then you're right. Yeah, I coach as well. And then coaching normally ranges around six hours at a time. I deal with a bunch of kids and help them get better. And the changes in the last eight years, Seamus, like diet, nutrition, all that kind of stuff, you know, physical fitness, 
how much has it changed since you were so young at 16 at your first Olympics? <laughs> More than I would like to admit. Um, it's, you know, this sport is definitely a young person's one and it takes your toll. It takes its toll on your body. Um, and I've had my fair share of injuries. And so becoming a little bit older, um, is, is come with its challenges. Now my diet is much more important, sort of, okay, like the meal that I have the night before is really going to influence how much energy levels I have the next day. And my recovery process after snowboarding is really going to influence how well I'm going to ride the next day. So I'm definitely approaching it now in a mature manner, which I think my body is thanking me for. Um, but I, I definitely can't get out there um, like I was a young kid, you know, sort of throwing all that to the wind. Um, it's, it's definitely requiring a lot more work on my half to, or on my behalf to, uh, to stay fit and healthy. So what's the, the, the meal the night before then? Meal the night before. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit impartial to steak, but we got to sort of offset the red meat. So a lot of green beans, maybe some mushrooms, some onions, started off with a salad. Um, I'm a big fan of kombucha. We got to keep high on the probiotics um and you know you cannot forget potatoes would you be in the same boat there now Bubba? yeah pretty much the same thing i like to uh get some pasta as well a nice carbo load the night before helps keep you warm i think what was the buzz like in the uh villages so sochi or, or korea pyeongchang lads was it was it great fun with the other athletes are you kind of a little bit concerned that in china with the restrictions with covid that it might be a, a little bit, uh, you know, claustrophobic out there. Well, I'm super thankful I was able to go to Pyeongchang. Just one, because it was unreal. And two, because now I get a real different Olympic experience because this one is going to be less, um, what's the word? We're not going to be able to do as much. The restrictions are going to keep us safe, which we're thankful for. We can't get COVID but then I don't think we're going to be able to spend as much time with other countries as last time. And for you, Seamus, how have you felt like the villages have been, you know, have you met new friends, you know, have you, you know, were you hanging out with other athletes from other countries? Mm -hmm. That's like, it's been one of the, um, the main sort of um, highlights for me over the last two games, especially Sochi. I mean, I was so young, I was 16 and I was just in awe of everything and um, staying in the same sort of village as my idols and, and being to go and eat in the same place as them and go and hang out in the game room with them. Like that was really big for me. Um, and seeing that I was, you know, part of that scene and, and, and one of them as well. Um, and again, in Pyeongchang, I mean, we had a great time there. We made a lot of friends um and got to meet a lot of people and, and this time around like yeah it you know admittedly it may be a little bit different but um it's kind of in its own way um sort of a mixed blessing so it's bringing it back to us and and you know placing the the really at the height of the importance of the games on our performance and our competition um and so i i think it'll be a positive experience either way and Tess, were your family out there in korea the last time and will you have anybody out there with you now in the in a few weeks time in Beijing? Yeah, all, fam all my family was there four years ago. So they're a bit sad that this year they cannot come, but at least we can go. It's not like for uh, Tokyo that it was uh, delayed one year after. So I think we're all just happy that we can all go and uh, still make it to the Olympics. And what's the diet and nutrition plan for you? Do you have a very strict regimen of what you need to do to get the energy going when you're hurting the 100 miles an hour down a, a ski slope? Uh, yeah, I would say maybe more like booba, pasta, uh, the race before is good. And uh, maybe some eggs uh, for breakfast. And it's not, we don't have a special um, uh, regime to, to have, but you know what you need to eat uh, before a race. Okay, we got to take a break. We're going to be back with more of our Winter Olympics panel on Off the Ball Saturday here with uh, Seamus O'Connor, Bubba Newby and Tez Arbe. After the news, stay with us. Don't go away. And you're welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. John Duggan with you through until five o'clock. This is the second half of the Saturday panel on Off the Ball. Looking ahead to next month's Winter Olympics in Beijing. We're delighted to be in the company of three Team Ireland athletes. Snowboarder Seamus O'Connor, 
representing Ireland at a third Winter Olympic Games. Freestyle skier Bubba Newby, who made his Olympic debut in Korea four years ago, and Alpine skier Tezar Bay, who's also marking her second appearance at a Winter Olympic Games. You're going to be in camp, folks, in Innsbruck in Austria over the next week before you go out to Beijing. Just on the issue of the individuality of your sports. So the importance of mental strength. You're, I believe, shame a study in psychology because I suppose it's a huge thing in this game. It looks so dangerous that I suppose you can't be thinking about injuries. You can't be thinking about things going wrong. You have to go out there with a huge amount of freedom. Um, yeah, I, it's, I would say personally, um, it's 80 to 90 percent mental. Um, it really comes down to how well you can, you know, tune out the stresses of competition, how well you can believe in yourself um and you know align yourself to put down the performance when it matters um it is a dangerous sport like you mentioned um and so injury and you know lack of performance and all these sort of negative thoughts are in the back of our minds you know always um but it's sort of finding the mental strength to to overcome that um has at least been you know a tough battle for me when i was younger but now you know getting older and also studying psychology um i feel like i've come a long way do you read a lot of mind literature? I tried to, yeah. And my professors are certainly um, are giving us quite the workload. So Bubba, what's the buzz like when you're 20 to 30 feet in the air? Is it like just this adrenaline that you wouldn't get normally? Is, is it a natural high that most of us don't know end of the bed? Yeah, it's a pretty next level adrenaline boost. You, I mean, it's tough to explain really how it feels because it's just, I don't think there's really words for it. It's more of a feeling. When you do it perfectly, there's little to no impact if you land high on the wall. If you don't do it perfectly, there's about as much impact as you can get, but it, we try not to do that. And then also you try to just stay focused on the one thing you're doing right then. If you're 15 to 20 feet out of a half pipe and you think, oh no, I, did I leave the oven on? You're gonna have a bad time. <laughs> you just stay present and uh, it all works out. You can't think of probably a second or two ahead. You have to be completely in the moment. Right in the moment. If you think about landing the next trick before you've landed the one you're working on, you're not going to land either. So when it goes wrong, is it just, you know, you're, you're going to go to one place and that's on the ice and it's going to be painful? Yeah. You're either going to pop, you're going to jump too hard and go out from the pipe and fall really far, or you're not going to jump enough and land on the top of the wall and then bounce to the bottom. So it's just, it can be brutal. When you're training, when you're in say Utah or these places, have you got people there on hand if something goes wrong and you got a serious injury? Is there some kind of medical support structure there? We've always got our coach around, Ian Burson, who's really good. And um, there's also ski patrol at the resorts. They're typically quite good with their response times. And so we've got, We've got help if we need it. The, the prospect of doing new tricks, you decide, okay, I'm going to do something here and that's new, and then you try it out. I'd say that's quite daunting and very exhilarating at the same time. Oh, yeah. It can be, it's such a battle getting through your head to do a new trick. But there's a lot of safe ways now to work on it. Well, safer ways to work on it. They set up big airbags at the bottom of a half pipe that you can practice it into. And at this level, nobody goes out there and just tries a new trick without ever working up to it. You're going to try it the safe way a few times, or you've already done, let's say you're doing a double cork 1260, you've already done thousands of single cork 900s. And so you've got the first half done. So we just take the steps in a safe, appropriate way and try to keep it as safe as possible. How test you got greater speed in what you're doing in terms of alpine skiing how does that come about uh how, in speed like how speed do you go yeah how, like obviously you want to go quicker you want to increase your times is that by uh you know cutting the edges more is it about you know what, what are the techniques for you to get faster as it were uh firstly maybe i said the lines like more you guys you go straight from one gate to the other uh more you get speed and how uh, you push on the edges, if it's uh, before the gates or after the gates, if you push just a little after the gates, you will just uh, break a little bit. So it's just a question of time. So where do you push on your, your edges? Have you had many injury tests? 
Uh, no, not for the moment. Just sometimes some a little bit of uh, pain in my back, but that's it. So I think I'm quite lucky because all nope. my friends make uh, ACL or things like that. No crashes. No, not no big crashes, but always we crash a little bit. Yeah, sure. And lads, have you had, I know you did your knee a few years ago, Seamus. Uh, was that a bit of a pivotal moment for you to go, okay, I might need to adjust what I'm doing here? Yeah. Um, injury is is a rite of passage in our sport, I think. Um, just about every skier or snowboarder you talk to has had a at least one knee surgery, if not two, three, and four. Um, so that's sort of how I've been trying to mature in my sport lately, is trying to sort of mitigate injury and, and staying physically fit. But um, there's some circumstances that you just can't account for. Um, and so, yeah, you know, put plenty of broken bones, plenty of ruptured tendons, uh, but it's all part of the game. And at the end of the day, um, you know, pain is temporary, but passion is forever. So, um, you know, we, we keep pushing forward. And, and injuries that you've had, Bubba? Um, I've been relatively lucky with my knees, but super unlucky with my shoulders. I've blown out my right shoulder twice. I actually competed in the 2018 Olympics with it blown out. I just didn't have time to get it fixed beforehand. So I just waited until we were done. And then uh, at the moment, I've got a pretty haggard toe just from <laughs> hitting it on my <laughs> ski boot all the time. It's, it's seen some damage. But other than that, I try to keep it safe. It's important to know. Obviously, you got to know when you have to do tricks, but it's more important to know when you shouldn't. So Sean White, he's the guy, isn't he, in terms of snowboarding? Is he, is he the Tiger Woods or the Michael Jordan of, of, of what you do, Seamus? Um, I would say in terms of longevity, absolutely. Um, there is no one quite like him in sort of the, the time span of his career and how consistent he's been in, you know, performing well and winning every single event and having multiple gold medals um, at the Olympics. He's, there's definitely not going to be anyone quite like him. Um, having said that, the Japanese team for the last few years, last, you know, eight years even, have been really pushing the, the new standards and have bringing in, you know, the era of the triple cork and the half pipe and, and new tricks. Um, so it's sort of a, um, a changing of the guard, I'd say. But in terms of, um, you know, as long as snowboarding's been around, Sean White's been on the top, so... Um, definitely have to credit him for that. I think being relaxed uh, is, is, is part of the mental thing. Is uh, I, I couldn't believe what I was watching last night. Um, but, but that guy, Red Gerard, uh, apparently he slept in before the Olympic Games, his run, and uh, he ended up winning the gold. But he won it like there was not a care in the world. He, that he was just, it was just, he was out for a, a stroll, obviously, on, on the board. But it was uh, incredible to see. Yeah, I'd say the bet on your best day, you're typically the most relaxed. Good things happen when you're calm and having fun not so good things happen when you're stressing what techniques do you guys use when you're training do you listen to music is that a big thing it is for me i i know that like if if something were to happen like if i lost my earbuds or if my phone somehow died or if i didn't have access to my music it would be tough to come back from um, which is like not a great thing to rely on but um yeah music is huge for for tuning out sort of those negative thoughts and um, you know, other ways of controlling your adrenaline, you know, breathing and sort of removing yourself from the moment um, can, can go a long way. So what do you listen to? <laughs> um, it depends. I'm, I'm a pretty, pretty wide guy in my music selection, but um, I listen to a lot of hip hop and rap, a lot of electronic music, um, essentially anything that'll, that'll kind of get me in the mood to like go to battle um, and, and to give it all. So what about yourself, Bubba? Do you use music as an aid? I use music during competitions. Not most days that I ski, not really. So I can do it both ways if I need to. But during contests, I'll put in the music. What'd you put on? I like uh, 90s hip hop, smooth jazz. Smooth <laughs> jazz is nice to keep you nice and <laughs> mellow. And then smooth jazz cover musics for like pop songs are great. <laughs> So like a smooth jazz Taylor Swift or <laughs> you're a big fan. 
So you're gonna be are you, you're gonna be in Beijing with a smooth jazz Taylor Swift going on your earbuds <laughs> when, when you're in the middle yeah. of the uh, the Olympics. Just like we're in a nice jazz lounge. <laughs> have you uh, have you shared this information with the rest of Team Ireland yet? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'll give them my playlist. <laughs> Tess, are you going to be listening to some smooth jazz when you're on those slopes? No, not yet, but maybe I should try. It seems to Do work it. for Buba, no? <laughs> Do you use do any techniques to uh, get yourself in the frame of mind to perform, Tess? Um, what I need is to be with my friends, uh, joking uh, at the start, laughing, not to be uh, too focused on what's going to happen, because otherwise I'm just uh, losing my mind and lost the focus so I have to to laugh being in, in a good mood uh, and that's it I think I, I wrote out a few names there and to be honest I don't know them very well LaShawn White, so David Wise, Red Gerard are the people in Alpine skiing that you look up to Tess? Um, I would say Michaela Schifrin she's she's the best uh, in in all disciplines for like uh, I don't know 10 years she's the leader in everything so she's she's really good what makes her so good? Um, I think her technique, uh, it's perfect. She knows exactly what to do. Uh, she never makes mistakes. And I think she has a really good uh, physical preparation too. So it's great. We can uh, joke that we don't have snow here, folks. Um, but what does it mean to you, Seamus, to be representing Ireland at the Olympic Games for the third time? Um, it really means everything to me. Um, when I first started snowboarding, I never imagined that it would turn into something more than just a recreational sport on the weekends. Um, and then eventually making that into, you know, a 10 plus year Olympic career um, has been, has been life changing and has been eye opening and, you know, all of the above and to represent, um, you know, the country that, you know, my father came from and his, his parents came from and the country that I used to spend summers in as a child. And, you know, I have a very deep connection and to represent that on the world stage now for a third time in a row is, um, it's pretty surreal. And um, I couldn't be more thankful. Do you think there's a heightened interest in winter sports in Ireland, Seamus? Would you say that that's accurate? I think this time around, to be honest with you, we're seeing a lot more, um, you know, activity and buzz and, and interest in the sport and, and winter sports in general. And to to see that, you know, come from 2014 when, um, you know, I was the, the only, you know, freestyle athlete. And now, you know, we have Bubba, you know, returning for a second time. And, you know, people are messaging me on Instagram, finding out, hey, how can I represent Ireland? What are the steps to that like? Um, to see that sort of groundswell come up over the past eight years um, is beyond inspiring. Have, have you ever been back to Cork, Bubba? I haven't been back to Cork yet. I've been to Dublin a few times. I'm really dying to get back to Cork. Unfortunately, we, I mean, we couldn't travel the past two years pretty much, but I really want to go back. I have this picture, a family picture of us with this castle behind it that I've seen my whole life. I'm really trying to go explore that thing. And um, so, yeah, please, if anybody has recommendations of where to go, hit me up. Yeah, listen, they call it the Rebel County. Did you know that, Bubba? The Rebel County. I yeah. like the sound of that. <laughs> and uh, have you ever, have you ever, have you ever seen hurling? They're they're really, you know, it's a, it's a big tradition of of an Irish sport. Hurling over in Cork is a is a big thing. Hurling looks so gnarly. Like it's a good way to lose teeth. I think I like. <laughs> Freestyle skiing looks safer. Is what you're saying? Well, I don't have to worry about getting smoked in the head with a stick on skis. <laughs> But if someone gives me curl hurling lessons, I'll give them some ski lessons. We can make a trade. Yeah, yeah. Kinsale is a good place, uh, Bubba. Uh, this one place I'd recommend if you're gonna, ever going to go back to Cork. Kinsale, it's, uh, it's a great town. Have you um, been to Ireland yourself, Tess? Yeah, I've been to Dublin a few times before. And uh, this summer, we've planned to make a little world trip around the island. So this will be great. What is the support like in terms of funding and sponsorship? How do you make this work for you Tess in terms of actually becoming an Olympian do you get support from the tier from the Olympic Council the Olympic Federation uh yeah we had um, a scholarship for the Olympics so this was really really great and really helpful 
because uh, otherwise it's really expensive and it's not so easy to find uh, to find some uh, help in France actually. And in terms of your support, Seamus, are you on a on a on a, a grant or a code or anything like that in terms of funding, or, or do you have to work outside what you're doing day to day to to keep yourself going? So similar to Tess, um, yeah, a very thankful recipient of an IOC scholarship um, for the lead up to these games, as well as um, additional funding support from the Snow Sports Association. And um, without, you know, those two support avenues, um, this would absolutely not be possible. Um, I used to have um, pretty decent sponsorships back in my in my younger years in the sport, um, but now it's it's becoming a sort of a much more harder world to navigate. Um, so without those um, supports, like I said, wouldn't be possible. Are you also on a, on a code where you get some funding yourself, Bubba? Yeah, I'm on a grant through the Snow Sports Federation, the Snow Sports Association of Ireland. And uh, it, I couldn't do it without them. And then to help out as well, I uh, work all summer coaching at the Utah Olympic Park. It's like an aerials pool, so you have jumps that go into the water. So I watch kids just get tossed into the pool all summer and help them learn tricks. And then I also built fences all summer this year. Definitely wouldn't recommend it. Not that big of a fan, but it helps pay the bills. So, Is this going to be your life, folks? Is this going to be your life when this Olympics is over, say the next 10, 20 years? Are you always going to be associated with what you do? Is, it, is this something you want to continue to be involved in? I mean, I'm going to have a tough time getting out of the mountains myself. It's just, it's a great lifestyle. The people are all so nice. Mountain rules are different. And uh, I can't say I'll ever leave the mountains. I want to become a surfer one day, though. So we'll see. What are the mountain rules? <laughs> <laughs> They're tough to explain. They're unwritten mountain rules. Uh the surf so you maybe a trip to california hawaii man maybe in the, in the next few years oh i really want to one thing that all the places we get to go to have in common is it's so cold and um i'm trying to go somewhere tropical sit on a beach and then learn to surf it's fun learning new things and um i hear the water is a little less painful than the half pipe <laughs> Did you find in a way that Seamus, when you're involved in this as a 16 year old at the Olympics, that you lost a few years in any way that, that the, the stuff you want to do that you didn't get the chance to do in your teenage years? Because effectively, you're, 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 you're 10 years being a, a full time sports person at a very young age. Um, I used to sort of dabble with those thoughts. Um, you know, I've been either homeschooled or online schooled pretty much my entire life until actually going to university in the last few years. Um, so I used to think maybe, you know, I was missing out on some of these, you know, formidable school friendships that you make, uh, you know, when you're going through, through high school and things like that. Um, but looking back on it now and, and looking back on it with a little bit more maturity, um, I, I wouldn't, you know, trade it for the world. And I'm just so grateful that my parents allowed me to do this. And, you know, we were able to figure everything out with schooling um, because the experiences I've had as a professional snowboarder and as an Olympic athlete, um, to me, it's shaped who I am. And it's something that I'll have, you know, until the day I die. And um, I couldn't be, you know, more thankful. What's the plan then? Are you going to stay involved in, in these kind of snow sports, you think, in the next few years? Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to direct my, my education path and my future career path, um, you know, into a sort of uh, an industry where I can still work within um, snow sports or action sports. Um, so I picked the psychology discipline. I want to eventually go into sports psychology um, and work alongside, you know, athletes that are going through some of the things that I went through um, during my career. Um, it's definitely something that's shaped my life up until now. And i um, will continue to do so. What's the plan for you, Tess? How long do you keep on wanting to ski for? Oh, I don't know yet, but uh, of course, when I will end my career, I will, I will stay in the mountains, maybe uh, coach some young, uh, young Irish uh, who wants to go to the Olympics too. That would be great. And I think it could be a, a good uh, way to, to, to go from an Olympian uh, athlete to a coach. What is your expectation then, Tess, for Beijing? What, what, is it a personal best? Is that your thing to do? What, what would you be happy with? 
of course, personal best. We always want to do better. And, uh, but the thing is to finish because it's really important to finish, to have a, you know, a result and in speed uh, Portugally because um, uh, before uh, no Irish uh, woman raced in Super G. So it would be great if I, I can finish uh, those races. Are the courses different from one place to the next? Like, have you done a lot of research on, on China? Uh, no, my coach uh, sent me the videos of the slopes. It seems a little bit like uh, Korea, the snow and uh, the kind of mountains. But uh, I, I have no idea if it's really steep uh, or flat. I don't know. Are the nerves there? Are, did it get easier or does it get harder with the nerves as it goes along? Uh, I would say harder. Harder, okay. Is it because you're thinking about it more or? Yeah, it's, it's most stressful, I'd say. Okay. And do you get a buzz, uh, still a kick out of the fact that you're going so fast and this is really something that, that must be giving you a lot of electricity through your body? Uh, yeah, when, you're, when you are skiing, you, you don't think about it, but when you pass the line, you're like, oh my God, uh, I just did that and this was scared, but you're done, so it's fine after. Pumba, what's your expectation? What do you hope to achieve in uh, Beijing? Um, I'm just hoping that I can land a really clean run and do better than I did last time. I got a few new tricks I'd love to throw in competition. And um, I want to get the grabs nice and clean. And I really want it to look good. How many goes do you get? Like, is it three? You get two runs. You get two runs, okay. Two um, run qualifier and then three run final if you make it. And how many make the final? Um, I believe it'll be 12. Okay. And Seamus, your ambition? Your um, first and foremost, staying on my feet, staying healthy, staying strong. Um, I have a specific run that I really want to do there that I've had in my head now for a little while. Um, so if I can go out there and land that run cleanly, um, and this one trick that's sort of evaded me all the way, you know, back to Sochi. Um, so if I can, if I can piece it all together, that would be a dream come true. Um, in terms of the standings, I don't know, shooting for around the top 15, hopefully, but um, I'm still managing a little bit of an injury. So we'll, we'll take it as it comes. There's not many of you going out there for Winter Olympics. You must be very tight as a unit. There must be a degree of um, real connection between all of you, Tess and yourselves and whoever else qualifies. I know um, uh, Ezra Desmond has qualified in the Luge, for example. Um, you're behind the Irish flag. It's something that you must be very proud of, James. It is um, incredibly so. And to um, go again to Beijing and to have Tess coming along as well and to have Bubba there and our other teammate Thomas, you know, all returning Olympians. Um, we created such a strong bond in, in Pyeongchang. We had such a great time. Um, and so to come back and do that again together with the addition of a few more um, teammates is going to be a really surreal experience and um, I can't wait. To finish, uh, Tess, uh, who have your inspirations been within skiing and outside your sport? Without whom, who would this not have been possible without? Is it your family? Is it, you know, your own sense of determination? What has made this happen for you that you're going to Beijing? Of course, my family, I will, nothing will be possible without them because they are always uh, 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 supporting me, like uh, when I, I'm sad and I don't want to quit everything, they say no, and then you just have to focus again. And it's, it's really tough because it's always uh, ups, ups and downs, you're happy, and the next day it's a bad race, so you just want to uh, quit everything. So they're always pushing behind, and this was really, really uh, helpful. Who's your inspiring figure, Bubba? Uh, it would definitely be my dad. He put me on skis when I was four. He took us up every weekend. And he's just as passionate of a, skier, of a skier as I am. I mean, the guy's 60 and he'll hit the half pipe with me. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, so I'm gutted that he can't be out there with us. But I know he'll be watching. He was teaching in Cork when you were born. Mm -hmm. He was teaching economics at the university or college, UCC. And what's his name? Van. And uh, I say he's, must have a, a fond affinity with Ireland as well. Yeah.
Oh, yeah, and I'm super thankful they decided to move there. Absolutely. And Seamus, for you, your inspiration as you maybe approach your last Olympics? Yeah, um, certainly my folks um, and specifically my dad. Um, he was the one who was always traveling around with me when I was younger. You know, I used to call himself the taxi driver because, you know, it was just from one event to the other. And so without him, you know, putting in all those efforts at such a young age, you know, when I was young, um, none of this would have been possible. Um, and, you know, at the last Olympics, he was able to come and watch. And I was just sort of like a, a peak for our relationship together. And, and now to go to a third one, um, he's always there with me in my mind. And so, um, yeah, definitely pops. OK, you got to leave it there. Seamus O'Connor, Bubba Newby, Tessar Bay, the best of luck in Beijing, folks. Well done for qualifying. Thanks for representing Team Ireland. We know that you're going to do us proud. Um, the best look in China. And we hope to speak to you on your journey uh, in the Winter Olympics. Thanks for your time this afternoon on Off the Ball Saturday. Thank you. Talk Thank to you, you soon. Thank you. OK, this is Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk. We're back after the break because we've got a new feature on Saturdays, My Racing Moment. It's coming up after this.